Stand and take our Bibles and turn to Proverbs 3, but also put a ribbon in Genesis chapter 37. Now, I kind of find myself as a preacher, I try to shake it up. I try not to do a lot of the same things. And, uh, and so pretty much this entire journey of Proverbs, I haven't really used a lot of Old Testament stories as illustrations, right? And last week I did. And then this week, as I began to pray, it's kind of a similar situation has unfolded, but I think it's going to be a real help to us. And so here's what you're going, we're going to do. We're going to read, we're going to read Proverbs 3, but I, you know, sometimes I read the text and I want you to really pay attention to the wording because we're going to spend a lot of time in Genesis, right? And I'm going to be kind of going back and forth, but if you just want to stay in Genesis, if you really paid attention to what I read, you'll be okay to do that. You get what I'm saying? All right, if you don't, just it'll be fine. (laughs) Proverbs chapter 3, and I want you to notice verse 31. Envy thou not the oppressor, and choose none of his ways. For the froward is abomination to the Lord, but his secret is with the righteous. The curse of the Lord is in the house of the wicked. But he blesseth the habitation of the just. Surely he scorneth the scorners, but he giveth grace unto the holy. The wise shall inherit glory, but shame shall be the promotion of fools. I want to preach on this subject with the Lord's help. Wisdom in our oppression. Wisdom in our oppression. Father, bless now the preaching of your word. I pray that you give us some practical help tonight. Bless the preaching of your word, we ask in Jesus' name. All of God's people said, and thank you. You may be seated. Envy thou not the oppressor, and choose none of his ways. Um, let's go ahead and go over to Genesis 37. And I want to I start by kind of saying this, that when you follow the life of Joseph, okay, Joseph is... We go through the life of Joseph, and here's what we find. That Joseph, in much of his life, was the object or the recipient of oppression. Oppression. It means this. Violence, wrong oppression, or oppression that is gained by violence or wrong. You want to hear something interesting? The Hebrew word for oppression is Hamas. I thought that was kind of interesting. Speaking of those who by violence or by oppression harms another or gains at the expense of another. It, it is often used to speak of a ruler or a dictator or a power who, who gets his position through assassination or through deceit uh, or through, through oppression over the people. Just here recently I was reading about Saddam Hussein and, and his rise uh, over the people of Iraq. And you know what you'll find? that throughout his regime and his rise, there were a lot of people that died. And when he ruled over Iraq, there were a lot of people that died for him to maintain his power. That is is one concept of the word oppression. It is this idea of the use of violence or or oppressing someone to gain. But it it also has the idea of simply doing wrong to gain. To do wrong to someone. To harm someone, to afflict someone. So, so, on, so on the highest level, right? At its highest level, you have authorities and powers that are killing people and enslaving people to, to, to gain. But, but on a more minimal level, oppression is when we do wrong. And, and I'll show you this in the Word of God. When we, even Amos 3.10 talks about this. When we cheat people or do wrong to people in order to, again, we oppress them for our own benefit. And I want you to, to, to go along with this in my mind and think about how Joseph experienced oppression, first of all, of course, by his brothers. In verse 18 of chapter 37, the Bible says, When they saw him afar off, speaking of Joseph, even before he came near unto them, they conspired against him to slay him. And they said one to another, Behold, this dreamer cometh. Come now, therefore, and let us slay him and cast him into the pit. And we will say, some evil beast hath devoured him, and we shall see what will become of his dreams. And Reuben heard it, and he delivered him out of their hands, and said, let us not kill him. And Reuben said unto them, 
shed no blood, but cast him into this pit that is in the wilderness and lay no hand upon him that he might rid him out of their hands to deliver him uh, to deliver him to his father again. And it came to pass when Joseph, now remember this is a real human being. It came to pass when Joseph was coming to his brethren that they stripped Joseph out of his coat, his coat of many colors that was on him, and they took him and cast him into a pit, and the pit was empty and there was no water in it. And they sat down to eat bread and lifted up their eyes and looked, and behold, a company of Mishmaelites came from Gilead with their camels bearing spicery and balm and myrrh, going to carry it down to Egypt." And Judah said unto his brethren, What profit is it if we slay our brother and conceal his blood? Come and let us sell him to the Ishmaelites, and let not our hand be upon him, for he is our brother and our flesh. And his brethren were content. Then there passed by Midianite uh, merchantmen, and they drew up and lifted up Joseph out of the pit, and sold Joseph to the Ishmaelites, for 20 pieces of silver, they brought Joseph unto Egypt. So here is Joseph. He's heading down to check on his brothers at his father's behest. This is not Joseph, you know, being a little telltale brother. Uh, I've, I've read some people try to paint Joseph as though he was uh, negative. Let me just tell you something. Whenever the Bible chooses not to paint someone negative, don't paint them negative. There's plenty of people that get painted negative in the Bible. Let's not add to the list. Amen. So, so we've got enough examples of negativity in the Scripture. When God gives us someone and doesn't give it to us, let's not assign unto him negativity. So he's, he's, going down to, he, he's going down to check on his brothers, and they take him, they seize his coat, because they're jealous. They're jealous of his dreams, and I think in their mind, they know that God is probably going to do what, that these dreams he's saying are real. And so they strip him of this coat that represents his father's favor for him. And they throw him into a pit. So now imagine here you are, you're Joseph. You've been cast into a pit by your brothers. Now, now, now understand the rage that he would have observed from his brothers. When, when somebody strips you and throws you in a pit... It's, it, I no doubt that he could feel the fact that this wasn't a joke. That, that the rage was so intense that they're probably just going to either leave him there to die or they're going to kill him. So, so he's going through the fear and the trauma and the shock of being stuck in this pit all by himself, clear away from home, not knowing how to get out, not knowing what to do. And then they pull him out. And then suddenly he finds himself in front of however many hundreds, a minimum hundreds of Ishmaelites with slaves. And now he is seized by them and becomes one of their slaves and is about to be carried away from his home, brought down into a foreign land, into an Egyptian country where nobody knows who he is, nobody can protect him, Nobody can help him. Nobody can find him. And he's marched down and he is eventually sold. And, and he finds himself working for Potiphar. Now I want you to put yourself in his mind. That is the very definition of oppression. He, he, has been, he has lost his home. He has had his relationships taken from him. He has been thrown into a pit. And now he's living every day as a servant. He's lost his freedom and he has no say, no control over his life. But that's not the end of the oppression. So he works for Potiphar, as, Potiphar, as most of us are aware, and, and he does well. But then Potiphar's wife gets her eyes on him. And I want you to notice chapter 39 and verse 14. Chapter 39, verse 14. And she called unto the men of her house... And spake unto them, saying, He hath brought in an Hebrew unto us to mock us. He came unto me to lie with me, and I cried with a loud voice. And it came to pass when he heard that, that I lifted up my voice and cried, that he left his garment with me and fled and got him out. And she laid up his garment by her until his Lord came home. And she spake unto him according to these words, saying, The Hebrew servant which thou hast brought unto us came in unto me to mock me, and it came to pass as I lifted up my voice and cried that he left his garment with me and fled out um, 
And it came to pass, when his master heard the words of his wife, which she spake unto him, saying, After this manner did thy servant to me, that his wrath, he, that is explosive anger, his wrath was kindled, and Joseph's master took him and put him into prison, a place where the king's prisoners were bound. He was there in the prison. So now you are, you're Joseph, and you're working, and, and you're, you're working for Potiphar, and now Potiphar's wife is trying to have an affair with you, and you read the, pa the passage every day, and you're telling her no. And then she accuses him of trying to force himself on her, and suddenly now he's being falsely accused. Her husband believes it. I've heard many people try to say he didn't believe it. Well, his wrath was kindled. That's, not a, that's, that's an implication. He was pretty mad about it. And he has him thrown into prison. And so now he's been oppressed by his brothers, He's been sold. He's been taken away from his home. He lives in a foreign land. And, and now he's in jail. He's been oppressed by Potiphar's wife. And, and as verse 34 in Proverbs would say, he finds himself in the position of the lowly. Lowly, weak, afflicted. Those made low by affliction. And Joseph in all of it has maintained his integrity. No, no. Joseph's, Joseph was a good son. He was a faithful steward. He was a faithful son. The, the, the coat of many colors, you could argue, was not the wisest thing for his father to do. But that wasn't Joseph's doing. The dreams that were given to him were given to him by God. And he was communicating what God showed him. He, had, he, he was faithful, he was honorable, and yet this happened to him. And then he was faithful at Potiphar's house, and he was a good steward. And he refused to have an affair because he had so much integrity. And now he is in prison. So now I want you to get this. So he's been, he's, been, he's been full of integrity. He's been a good man. He's been a righteous man. But yet he finds himself in this lowly position. Why? By, because of an oppressor. Okay, statement. There are times in the story where God's order seems to be failing, inoperable, or maybe even untrue. This is particularly the case with oppression. Okay, forget what you know about the story of Joseph. And here you are, and you're Joseph, and you've been a good son, and God's been telling you this stuff, and you're, and you're obeying God, and you're doing right, and then all of a sudden, you get sold as a slave. And then you go work for Potiphar, and you do right, and you're not having an affair, and you're being godly, and you're being holy, and now you're in a jail. Okay, let's pause the story. And here's what we know the Bible says, that God rewards the just and, and honors those who do right, right? And he brings consequences to the sinner. That's God's way. That's God's order. That, that those who do wrong and those who disobey, there's chastisement. And those who obey the Lord will be blessed and be honored. But when you pause the story right here, that isn't evident. Because Joseph's brothers are at home enjoying whatever they're doing. And Potiphar's wife is going on about her own business, and Joseph is in jail. And to, to a Joseph, he could look around with the promises of God that God is supposed to reward him and bless him for integrity. And, judge. and you know what it could look like? That this order, these promises are failing, or, or not in operation, there's a malfunction, or maybe even they're just not true. There are times where you and I find ourselves in a land far from our choosing. We find ourselves in a prison, if you will. And we've done nothing wrong. And above it, the person who is doing wrong is enjoying the fruits of doing wrong. Where the oppressor is winning... And we are being made low. Where the cheaters and the liars get the promotion, and you're at the bottom doing all the work. Where we are under an authority who is overworking us, mistreating us, even though we do right, it just continues. Where people have misrepresented us to get favor or sympathy, and then people believed them, 
and we find ourselves being mistreated and looked down on. And we pause in the story and we look for God. And we look for the promises of His Word to be operable. That God is supposed to vindicate us and reward us. And, and that God is supposed to you know, bring justice to the evildoer. Come on, this is real life. But sometimes when we pause in the middle of the story, that's not what we see. And that can be hard. It can be hard to do right and obey God and have integrity and watch someone in your job or in some other area of your life, they have no integrity, they aren't doing you right, they aren't handling the situation, and they just keep going up, 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 and you just keep going down, 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 down. And then you come to church and hear the pastor, you know, hit the pulpit and say, bless God, God is faithful, he'll reward you. And you're thinking, well, where is that at? Come on, this is real life. There are times where we pause in the middle of the story and we don't see God's order unfolding in front of us. And there's a temptation in verse 31 when he says this, Envy thou not the oppressor. The word envy, listen to this, the word envy means to become red. It speaks of being angry over the success of another and it also carries with it a desire to seize for oneself. So on one end, what can happen to us is when we see the oppressor, someone doing us wrong, someone not playing by the rules, and we're trying to do right, play by the rules, we can, want, first of all, we can get red. Angry. This is not right. This is not fair. You don't think that Joseph had to, me, had to deal with these emotions? You don't, I'm not saying that he succumbed to them, but you don't think that Joseph struggled internally thinking, man, I've done these things? And then he says this, envy thou not the oppressor, key phrase, and choose none of his ways. You know why he says that? Because we get read about the oppressor winning and then here's what we begin to think. Fine, you want to play that? I can play that too. You want to lie? You want to cheat? You want to manipulate? You want to go eye for eye, tooth for tooth? You want to get in the mud? Let's get in the mud. That's, that's the only way? That's how we're going to work at the job? That's how this company's going to work? Fine. I'm going to do what it takes. I'm not going to let this continue. I'm not going to let this happen. I'm going to make sure that I get what, I, what I'm supposed to get around here. And, and in all these phases of life, we can get this redness, this anger about seeing those gaining by wrong. And then the temptation is where you and I seek to play the same game so that we can fight back and get what we believe is right. While we may portray... We're, no, no. The fact that he's saying this tells us some things. While we may portray we're spiritually okay, oh, I'm okay, brother, God, God, I know God has got this. The oppression of others can make us dark inside. No, I, I, we know what to say, right? We don't, we don't come to church and say, man, I just hate that oppressor, and I'm just thinking about, I'm just thinking about, no, 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 oh, you know, I'm praying for them and blessing them. But inside, that's not what we're thinking. And we can talk a lot of light with our mouth. And inside, we can have a lot of dark feelings inside. Say it this way. The anger we, listen carefully. The anger we feel at the oppressor can be used to turn us into an oppressor. What can happen is, I think this is what Paul was getting at when he says, be not overcome with evil. That you and I see people taking advantage and hurting us and harming us or doing wrong or cheating the system and suddenly, and suddenly all of a sudden we get angry and we get in the same system so that we can benefit for ourselves. But here's what I want you to understand. That when we see no sign of God enforcing His order, there is still proof that God exists in those moments. Okay, let me give you the first... This, the, the kind of the, the, the simple one, but then I want to get into something a little better. First of all, here's the first proof. 
God told us this was going to happen. Envy thou not the oppressor and choose none of his ways. What is God saying to us? Here's what God's saying. There's going to be times, there's going to be people that are going to oppress you and I'm not going to stop them. If God always was going to stop the oppressor, we would never have this verse in our life. You hear what I'm saying? If God was always going to deal with the oppressor immediately on the spot, on time, and we were going to always be rewarded for our righteousness, then there would be no worry about this verse because we would never envy because God would be taking care of it all the time. So the first proof is this. God already told me there was going to be times in my life where the bad guys, if you will, looked like they would be winning. There's going to be times in our government. There's going to be times in politics. There's going to be times in the corporation. There's going to be times maybe even a local church. I pray it's not very often a church. But you know what? People can, people can lie and manipulate right here in our church. And sometimes you can have stuff going on and, and we don't know about it. And, and God is saying, look, there are going to be times where there are things happening. And, you're, and you're, you are at the bad end of this. And I'm not going to always intervene right away. That's why this verse is here for you, because I'm telling you, this is going to happen sometimes. The expectation that God will always stop the oppressors in your life is counter to what God told you to expect. So if you're expecting differently, your, ex your expectations are not built on the Word of God. Have you ever thought, why does God give us the story of Joseph if God never allows oppression to happen? He's saying... Hey, I am a God of all power, but I'm going to allow some stuff because it's a sinful world. And there's some things that are going to happen, and I'm not always going to intervene in them all. But the second, the second evidence is this, is God's relationship with the oppressor and the oppressed. Okay. Um, hold your place here. Look at Proverbs real quick. We're going to jump back to Genesis, but I want, to, I want you to see this. Look at, look at Proverbs chapter 3. Look at verse 32. Okay, so, so actually look at verse 31. Envy thou not the oppressor and choose none of his ways, right? Four. Here's why. For the froward is an abomination to the Lord, but I want you to notice that we're going to labor on this part for right now. But his secret is with the righteous. The curse of the Lord is in the house of the wicked, but he blesseth the habitation of the just. Surely he scorneth the scorners, notice, but he giveth grace unto the lowly. Now that's an important phrase. What is he saying? He's, he's not, when he says he's going to give you grace, he's not saying in that moment he's going, to, he's going to exalt you out of it. Here's what he's saying. He's saying he's going to meet you in the middle of it. His secrets, I love that. It's, a, it's, a, it's, it's, it's God, when God's speaking of that, it's speaking of of, these, of his communication and relationship is with you. Secrets. Meaning as God doesn't speak to everybody. God's with us intimately. Guiding us, teaching us, instructing us, blessing us. Giving us grace. Okay, so let's go back to Genesis and look at, don't lose Proverbs, but look at Genesis chapter 39. So we pause the story and we're saying, man, here is Joseph and he's being oppressed and, and he's, been oppressed by, he's been oppressed by his brothers and he's been oppressed by Potiphar's wife and, and, and yet, yet God is saying that in this we can see God in the midst even while he hasn't flipped the scene. Joseph is being oppressed. Well, do we see evidence of God being with Joseph? Well, look at, look at chapter 39, verse 1. And Joseph was brought down to Egypt. And Potiphar, an, office, an officer of Pharaoh, captain of the guard, an Egyptian bought him with the hands of the Ishmaelites, which had brought him down thither. Stop. So right now he's under oppression. Would you agree with that statement? Would you agree with that statement? But let's see if the blessing and the secrets and the grace can be seen in Joseph's life. Verse 2, And the Lord was with Joseph, and he was a prosperous man, and he was in the house of his master, the Egyptian, and his master saw that the Lord was with him, and that the Lord made all he did to prosper in his hand, and, jo 
And Joseph found grace in his sight, and he served him and made him overseer over his house, and all that he had had put in his hand. So now get the picture. Joseph's brothers are still on top. He is a still, he is, he is a slave. But you know what, you know what he can see? God's with him. God's, God's moving in the midst of this stuff he's going through and blessing him. And he can see divine working and grace of God while he's a slave. Look at verse 20. So, so, so the same thing happens. Potiphar's wife, he's in oppression again. Joseph's master took him and put him in the prison, a place where the king's prisoners were bound. And he was there in the prison, but, so yes, yes, the oppressor is winning, but the Lord was with Joseph and showed him mercy and gave him favor in the sight of the keeper of the prison and of the keeper of the prison committed to Joseph's hands uh, all, that the, all, uh, all the prisoners that were in the prison and whatsoever they did there, he was the doer of it. So here he is, he's falsely accused. Yes, he's in jail, but you can st- so he could question the order of God, but he can't because you know what he sees while he's in the middle of oppression? God is all around him. God's given him favor with the guards. God's given him favor there in the prison. God's, God's doing things and blessing him from being a slave to being a prisoner. All these things are happening. So here's what Joseph can see. He doesn't see God bringing the hammer to all of the agents, but here's what he can see. But God is still here in my life. When we can't see God in the removing of oppression, we can see God in his presence in the oppression. And sometimes we're, we're only looking for God in the deliverance, but wait a minute, we need to look for God when he's with us in the prison. You will see him there with you. And I would say this, the dark times of oppression can bring close times with God. In the, in the manifold wisdom of God, do you know when some of our deepest and most intimate times with God is? Is when we're in the prison. Do you know why? Because we, we need him and we seek him in a different way when we're lowly. And when he's there with us, our knowledge of him, our love of him, and our appreciation cultivates. So, so there's the evidence of God with those that are oppressed. But then he had said, if you remember, he said in verse 32, he said, the froward is an abomination to the Lord. The word abomination speaks of something disgusting, an abhorrence. You, you know, there's things, I don't know if there's things about you, there's some things if I smell them, you know what I mean? It, it's like I can't be around that smell. You know, like in my house, I've always tried to contribute in the house to cleaning and, and handling diapers and stuff like that. But I'm just going to tell you, if a kid throws up, I can't be near the throw up. <laughs> That's the picture of abomination. It, we detest it so much, we can't even be in the presence of it. God's saying that people that are oppressed, he, he removes his presence from them. Then it says this, the curse of the Lord is on the house of the wicked. A curse means to devote to evil. It means to hand over to evil. And it says this, he scorneth the scorners. So God treats those how they treat others. So the picture is, is that while we're in the middle of oppression, right? We're in the middle of oppression. God is blessing us. We can see his presence. We can see his favor. But then what about the oppressors? Because they're, on, they're doing great and they're on the throne. Well, God says this, but my curse is on them. They're an abomination. And I want you, to, well, do we see any evidence of this? Well, look at chapter 37 of Genesis. If you're awake tonight, say amen. amen. Notice, notice, verse, notice chapter 37, notice verse 31. And they took Joseph's coat and killed, and killed the kid of the goats and dipped the coat in the blood. And they sent the coat of many colors and they brought it to their father and said, This have we found. Know now whether it be thy son's coat or no. And he knew it and said, it is my son's coat. An evil beast hath devoured him. Joseph is without a doubt rent in pieces. And Jacob rent his clothes and put sackcloth upon his loins and mourned for his sons many days. Verse 35. And he meant the oppressors and all his sons and all his daughters rose up to comfort him. But notice this. But he refused to be comforted. 
And he said, for I will go down into the grave until my son's warning. warning. Thus his father wept for him. So you know what they thought? They were going to get to go back and they were going to get the favor and the blessing of their relationship with their dad. But you know what they found? There was a distance there. From the loss and the mourning over his son. You see it continued in chapter 42. Chapter 42, you, you continue to see God's hand is not on them. Verse 1 of chapter 42. Now when Jacob saw that there was corn in Egypt. you know why they were looking for corn in Egypt? Because there was no corn in Israel. Do you know why there was no corn in Israel? Because what they were doing. Because God was at work. So they're going through a famine. No, no, no. They've gotten away with their oppression, but they're going through a famine. But we're not done yet. And he said, Behold, I have heard that there is corn in Egypt. Get you down thither and buy for us from thence that we may live and not die. And Joseph's ten brethren went down to buy corn in Egypt. Verse 4. But Benjamin, Joseph's brother, Jacob sent not with his brethren, for he said, Lest peradventure mischief befall him. Do you see that there, do you see that there is like, there, there, is a, there is a stain, there is a mar on that house. They, they got rid of Joseph and they thought, oh, we're just, everything is going to be great. But it wasn't great. His dad never moved on. And, and now he won't send Benjamin. Why? Because there is a, there is a lack of trust. And there is, there, is a, there, is a, there is a wall that has built between their father and their sons. They're not being blessed. And now they're in the middle of a famine and they don't have food. That is all the Lord's working. Then, of course, they come and, and they stand. Then they stand before Joseph. We know the story and he's the Pharaoh. And I'm going to get to that in a minute. And he says, hey, where's your brother? Because he doesn't know if they've slain his brother. And they're like, well, we don't have our brother. So look at chapter 42 and look at verse 15. Hereby ye shall be proved... By the life of Pharaoh, ye shall not go forth. He's second in command of Pharaoh. Ye shall not go forth thence, except your youngest brother come hither. Send one of you, and let him fetch your brother. And ye shall be kept in prison, that your words may be proved, whether there be any truth in you, or else by the life of Pharaoh, surely you are spries. And he put them all together in the ward three days. And Joseph said unto them, they don't know it's Joseph, the third day, this do and live, for I fear God. If ye be true men... Let one of your brother be bound in the house of your prison. Go ye, carry corn for the famine of your houses. But bring your youngest brother unto me, so share your words, be verified, and ye shall not die. And they did so, and said one to another, We are verily guilty concerning our brother, in that we saw the anguish of his soul when he besought us, and we would not hear Therefore is this distress come upon us. And Reuben answered, saying, Spake I not unto you, saying, Do not sin against the child, and ye would not hear? Therefore, behold, all of this blood is behind you. See, you feel that? The division, the guilty conscience, not being able to move on, not being able to move past. Do you know what this is? This is God's hand being removed from them for their oppression. This is God's blessing being removed. And you know what jo- You know what? nobody can see? If you're Joseph, you can't see all this internal strife at the house. You can't see all the anxiety and all the guilt that they feel inside. But it's all happening, just as God said, for the oppressor. Before Joseph is able to really know what's going on in the life of this family, we are able to know that the oppressor's life is not smooth sailing because the blessing of the Lord has been removed from it. God can turn, listen to this, God can turn the oppressor's throne into a thorn. The very throne that they got by their oppression has become a thorn in their life. And people who, you know, it's an amazing thing, you read about people who gain, and, and, and even like ruthless dictators, and you find out their, their emotional problems and their mental problems and all the stuff that goes on. Like you take a palace by killing a bunch of people, you don't sleep super well at night. Because you're always worried that you're the next person. You see, the oppressor can have the throne, but that very throne is often becomes a thorn in their life. When we pause in the story, the oppressor may be on top, but understand this, God will always be involved. But that's not the end. 
Because in verse 35 of Proverbs, he says this, the wise shall inherit glory, but shame shall be the promotion of fools. So, so God's saying this, in the middle of all this, you're going to see me working in your life. You're going to see my blessing. You're going to see my provision. You're going to see my hand. And, I'm, and you may not know it, but I'm going to be dealing with the oppressor. But that's not the end of the story. There is a shell. There is an inheritance. Shell implies a promise. Like you, ye shall receive your wages. We have an inheritance for us. A day, now listen, when God will flip the oppressor and those that are oppressed. When God will bring true righteousness and judgment and those who have done right will see the blessings and the rewards and those who have oppressed will be dealt with for them. Look, look at chapter 44, verse 18. You come to the very end and the brothers... And the brothers say this, and I think this is such a powerful verse. I mean, we have so much we could read, but we're just going to read one verse. Then Judah came near unto him and said, O my Lord, let thy servant, I pray thee, speak a word in my Lord's ears, and let not thy anger burn against thy servant. I love this phrase. For thou art even as Pharaoh. You know what happened to Joseph? God put Joseph on top and put the oppressor on the bottom. Joseph's brothers bowing, begging for mercy, and Joseph being in the position to choose to grant mercy. Now listen to me. In, in time, God will always establish His order. The oppressor will be made low, and the oppressed will rise. How that looks, and when it happens is all in the timing of God. But it will happen. Solomon wants you and me to understand this. God helps us through oppression, and then He exalts us over it. So you're in oppression. There's two phases to this. One, He will help you through it. He'll be there. His blessing will be there. His grace will be there. And then some point... He will exalt you over it. He will bring you to a place of reward and blessing. Three things and we're done tonight. Do not allow your anger at oppression to turn you into an oppressor. Being mistreated is tough. Watching people gain, breaking all the rules is hard but do not become the very thing that you're angry about. Number two, discover God's secrets in the middle of suffering. And you're in the middle of suffering, you know what God has? He has some secrets for you. He has some things He wants to show you about you and about Himself that, that, that are priceless. Let Him show you. And then thirdly, looking ahead will keep you holy within. You know what happens when you stop at the pause? If you give yourself time to fast forward and you say, I know this is how it is now. But one day, God is going to bless me. God is going to reward me. God is going to bring me to my place. If I do this righteously and rightly, you know what that will do? that will help your heart while you're in the middle of it. And sometimes what you have to do is look forward and realize, no, wait a minute, no, wait a minute, the wise shall inherit glory. Uh, there's glory coming for me. It's hard now. It's a struggle now. But there's honor coming for me. I don't know when. I don't know where. I don't know how. But God's going to do it. And when you look ahead like that, you know what it does? It keeps your heart pure. That enables you to keep being holy and keep being pure and keep being just while you're in the middle of oppression. And so Solomon tells us, envy not thou the oppressor. Choose none of his ways. God helps us through oppression and then 
He exalts us over it. May God help us to not choose the ways of the oppressor. Father, we thank you for your word tonight. And it's such a challenging thing, Father, because in many ways our system is built on oppressive practices and, 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 and doing things at the expense of other people. And, and so oftentimes we see people that are cheating and manipulating and, and, and playing politics, moving ahead, and we're left in the dirt. We're left in the dust. But Father, will we always see that while we're in the dust, you're there with us. And you have secrets for us and you have blessings for us right there in that minute. And then eventually you have glory for us. I pray you'd encourage us to be like Joseph, to maintain our integrity when others around us are not. Bless this time of invitation, we pray. In Jesus' name, with every head bowed, every eye closed as we stand to our feet. The invitation is open tonight. With every head bowed, every eye closed as we stand to our feet. If you'd like to pray where you are, if you'd like to come to the altar, however the Holy Ghost has spoken, let's respond to God tonight.